Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out on this, you know, potentially treacherous evening. So, Brattleboro, you rock. I just can't believe it. I mean, it's the only place I know that, you know, we could fill the house on a night like this um, for this wonderful program. So, uh, let me get to it, since you all made the effort to get out here. Um, first of all, welcome to First Wednesdays. Is there anyone here that has never been to a First Wednesday before? <gasps> Welcome, welcome. Some people came from out of state, even I know. Um, well, if you would like to be on the mailing list, uh, look for me with one of these uh, clipboards, and we'll get you on the mailing list so you can hear about all of our First Wednesday programs. Um, these are, of course, all thanks to the Vermont Council of Humanities, and uh, you know, aren't we lucky for them? Uh, also, thanks to the Vermont Department of Libraries, who underwrite this program, and the National Life Group F Foundation. Um, we also, for this program, are underwritten by Chroma Technology, the Crosby Gannett Fund of, uh, of the Vermont Community Foundation, Merchants Bank, right across the street, um, University of Vermont Humanities Center, VPR, and then the library underwriters for this program are Brattleboro Camera Club, Brattleboro Savings and Loan, also just across the street, um, Downs, Rackland Martin, PLLC, the Richards Group, and World Learning. So let's give them all a big hand. But also, and I know you've heard me say this, many, many, many thanks to your friends and mine, the friends of the Brooks Memorial Library. Right, give it up for the friends. Um, we could not have this program if not for the friends. And in fact, we couldn't have most of the programs that we have at this library if not for the friends. They truly are such valued members of our community. And I know I won't embarrass anyone by asking you to raise your hand and say who is a friend, but I know there are many, many friends in this um, audience tonight. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. Uh, I also have to give a few notices of other upcoming programs. If you uh, come to the library on a Wednesday when it's not a first Wednesday, you can join our drop-in Scrabble group. And I know many of you here love words. Um, and next, uh, a week from Saturday on January 14th, we're gonna be having a Speak Out event. And this is a chance for everybody in the community to come and read an inspiring passage or recite an insi inspiring poem or write something themselves to um, talk about celebrating uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, his principles of love and social justice. So we'll be having that big community event and that's for all ages. So bring your kids, bring your grandkids. Um, also, some of you may remember Jerry Carboni. Jerry, are you here to <laughs> I bet you wonder what he's been up to. Well, you can come on Saturday the 20th, uh, the 28th at 3 o'clock and find out because he is, has just returned from a two-week hiking trip in Italy. Can you believe he gave all this up for that? <laughs> Please. Um, but he will come and he'll be showing his slides and he stared into the crater of Vesuvius. So we can all see that. I know, right? And after after that, um, the library uh, will be participating in a getting involved in your community fair um, immediately after that, actually, at the American Legion right across the way. So you can just listen to Jerry, come on over, you know, traipse across the parking lot, and we'll all have more fun. So, after all that, um, the other person I did not mention is our very, very valuable friends. Carol and Jeff Gaddis, who you know, um, I thank every month for underwriting this program. And guess what? Carol is here tonight. <laughs> so, I know. Um, so Carol is here tonight, and in addition to sponsoring, being one of the sponsors of this program, she is also going to introduce our speaker. So Carol, you want to come on up? Thank you. Um, well, I am representing, I'm representing the Vermont Department of Libraries and the National Life Group uh, Foundation as a board member from the Vermont Humanities Council. 
As always, I would also like to thank the Brattleboro um, Memorial Library and the friends of the library for their constant support of these programs. It's been really tremendous. Tonight, we're so lucky to have Peter Travis. He recently retired from Dartmouth College where he was the chair of the English department and taught courses in Chaucer, medieval drama, Old English, and Icelandic literature, men's studies, and literary theory. <laughs> his major field of interest has always been Chaucer, and his book, This Seminal Chaucer, won the Brooks Warren Prize for Excellence in Literary Criticism in 2010. In his courses on Chaucer, he encouraged his students to develop their skills in reading Chaucer's Fiddle English Aloud with accuracy and dramatic insight. We are very pleased and honored tonight to present Peter Travis. So it's fantastic to be here. Um, when I was in touch with uh, you folks, I said, well, I'll bring some handouts. How many should I bring? Uh, and I did give a version of this talk about a year ago in the Athenaeum on St. Johnsbury, and there are 40 wonderful people who showed up, and I couldn't believe 40 wonderful people would show up. Well, it looks like there's 80 or 90 or 100 wonderful people uh, uh, show up. I don't know what that has to do with North versus South or something like that, uh, but I'm really delighted uh, you're here. I was corresponding late this afternoon with somebody who's coming out with another revised edition of the Canterbury Tales. Uh, and I said that, and he was talking about uh, an edition of uh, criticism that I co-edited uh, co just a few years ago. And in that um, edition, I said, I, I sort of um, exclaimed about how healthy uh, the study of Chaucer was in the States and uh, throughout the world. Well, in the last two or three years, I found out that that's not the case, or it's not the case uh, anymore. So I'd like to hear uh, your voices for a minute or two, uh, just to know who we have out here in the 90 or so that are here. How many of you um, had a chance to study Chaucer at all anywhere in your education? How many hands? Wow. Do you see all those hands? All right. And how many of you studied Chaucer in uh, secondary school, high school, AP English? Okay. The numbers went down. And how many of you studied Chaucer in college? Look at those hands. Uh, and I won't ask how many studied uh, in graduate school because then I'll get fairly scared. <laughs> Maybe these ringers in here. Um, how many of you studied Chaucer in Middle English? That's, that's quite extraordinary, isn't it? And one more question. How many of you ever memorized a few lines of Chaucer in Middle English? See all those hands there? Okay, an embarrassing question. Of those who just raised their hands, how many are, say, under 45 years of age? <laughs> so what, what's my point? Yeah, it, it was a grand old tradition. I found out that in the southern states, in the United States, it's much more robust a tradition, but it is dying out. <clears throat> it used to be if I was traveling on a plane, for instance, and somebody sat next to me, and finally turns and say, well, what do you do? I had two options. One, if I decided I did not want to have a long conversation, uh, I would say I'm a medievalist, and that shuts things <laughs> down just like that. That's it. I open up my book and we don't. But if I said, oh, I teach Chaucer, more often than not, what in that opera will the show us uh, And we're going to do a little bit of that uh, in the next 45 or, or, or 50 minutes. OK, uh, so my game plan is to spend 45, 50, 55 minutes uh, doing most of the talking, but I will be throwing questions at you, and I'll be asking you to interrupt me at any time, at any time. Uh, and then in the second part of uh, the hour and a half or so, uh, we're going to have Q&A. Because my experience has been Q&A generates oftentimes the very best uh, discussions. So I've given you uh, handouts. And there are four sheets to the handout. Uh, the first one is um, in black and white, I, I'm sorry, uh, but a, a replication of the opening page of the famous Ellesmere manuscript, uh, which is now, anybody know where it is? Pasadena, California. Uh, 
where I had a chance at the Huntington Library to go genuflect in front of it every, uh, every morning. Extremely handsome, um, uh, which in fact, uh, we'll turn to it in a minute. I think you can, if you start bearing down on it, you can see that you can make some sense out of those, uh, those letters. Uh, another uh, handout are the, those uh, opening 18 lines of the general prologue, which we'll get uh, to a moment. Another handout, which I'll get to first, is um, you know, a simple kind of breakdown year by year of major events um, before Chaucer's lifetime, during Chaucer's lifetime, up to his death, those events being historical and political and literary um, and personal, uh, uh, personal for Chaucer's business life, if you will, and also for his uh, poetic life. And the last handout is some uh, unglossed, unannotated uh, Middle English from one uh, portrait in the general prologue, and we're all going to become students, uh, and we're going to read through it, and we're going to provide some responses to what we think uh, is going on there. Okay, so you get the sense of what the game plan is. Happy? Good. Yeah, who made the sign? What is a comic Chaucer? Or he's always, I mean, what did, what did it say? Funny. Still and he's still funny. After all these years. Still funny, absolutely. Still funny after all these years. So, um, Chaucer is English. He's a Londoner. He was born circa 1340. He died in 1400. Uh, upper middle class, uh, mercantile family. His father was a vintner. Uh, Chaucer was clearly very well educated. No evidence, however, that he ever went uh, to university. Uh, he traveled in fairly high circles. He married up. His wife was higher uh, on the aristocratic great chain of, uh, chain of being. They actually didn't live together all that long. Chaucer worked as a kind of um, high-level entrepreneur uh, and ambassador and uh, the sort of person who would not, as things are happening in Washington, be fired, but he'd be right on the cusp, if you want, okay? Just a bit underneath uh, the, the power dynamics of the political order under Edward III and uh, Richard II, and then for a couple of years, um, Henry IV. Uh, he traveled a good bit. He was in a war. He got, uh, <clears throat> he, he got captured. He was ransomed um, for less money than a good horse would have been ransomed. Uh, he uh, spoke French. He learned to speak uh, Italian because he was an ambassador to Italy uh, three times. Obviously, like anybody who was all educated, it was absolutely at home uh, in, uh, in Latin. Uh, he was a clerk for the king's works. He was uh, a forester uh, for the king. Uh, he was a, a, a customs agent, very, very important position because he oversaw uh, on the wharves of uh, London all of, the, all of the goods that went in and out, especially uh, the wool trade. A uh, very dicey position to be in. You can make a lot of money, but he also could really uh, get thrown into the tower. Um, the life records for Chaucer, compared to, say, Shakespeare's, are fairly good. I think there are 465 entries. But not one of those entries has anything to do with the fact that Chaucer was a poet. He was writing his poetry from the age of the late 20s all the way up until his death. It's clear that his poems were being circulated in a coterie of intellectual, sophisticated men and women of, uh, of letters. It's fairly clear that Chaucer read a lot of his poetry aloud from the manuscript uh, to an elite, uh, elite audience. He was actually known on uh, the continent for his translations, but he wasn't, his reputation was not primarily because he was a poet. He did not become the father of English literature or the father of English poetry until, oh, a half century uh, after his, his death. Um, the works, I think I was going to do this without even looking at the, uh, the notes there. The works that he is best known for, before we get to the Canterbury Tales, which is going to be my concentration, are early dream visions. The dream vision was a kind of poem where the poet, the I figure, the narrator, uh, is uh, always in May, the month of May, wandering around a sylvan glade. Uh, and then he falls asleep, and he wakes up in his dream, and then he has this marvelous experience. It's a wonderful set of metaphors where you can explore all kinds of ramifications of, uh, of the imagination and 
issues about nature and issues about the erotic life and uh, issues about courtly love. Um, and so he had four major dream vision poems that he wrote through the earlier part of his career. His other masterpiece, uh, juxtaposed to the Canterbury Tales, is Troilus and Crusader. Uh, it is, uh, I'm going to say this as a, as, a, as a statement of fact, but I guess it is only of opinion, the greatest narrative love poem in the English language. In fact, the greatest narrative of love uh, in the English language. Quite long uh, and totally complete. The other work is the Canterbury Tales. One of the striking features about the Canterbury Tales is that the Canterbury Tales is or are uh, not complete. They survive in, oh, 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 manuscript fragments. Two of them are more nearly complete than any of the others. But it's clear that Chaucer never fought, I would say. It's clear to me he never expected to finish the Canterbury Tales. It was always something that was a work in progress. It's also clear, I think, to all of us that he knew what the beginning was, and we'll get to that in a minute, uh, the, the, the uh, <clears throat> general prologue, and he knew what the ending was, and I'll mention that towards the end of my 45 uh, minutes or so. But in contrast to other um, very grand and very ambitious so summa works, or works that are sort of the summation of uh, what, is, uh, uh, what is available to a major um, creator talking about his culture, his tradition, his ideas, all of the issues that are important to his people, such as, for instance, the Divine Comedy uh, by, uh, by Dante, where Dante nails everything in place. You have a hundred cantos. Uh, they divide up perfectly into three different parts. The, so the, the architecture is almost arithmetical so that different cantos would talk to each other across enormous spaces. And 100 is the magic number. Or Boccaccio. Chaucer was in Italy when Boccaccio was still alive. No evidence that he met Boccaccio. No evidence that he, I mean, no evidence at all in his poetry that he cites his name. But there's no question that he knew a lot of Boccaccio's verse and would translate some and appropriate others. <coughs> including the Troilus and Crusader uh, story. But, but I'm on <coughs> Boccaccio. Boccaccio also wrote something that had a hundred segments to it. Uh, this is the Decameron. A hundred tales told ten a, a, a day over ten days. So a hundred is sort of like the perfect number. So Chaucer, a few, you know, not, not even a few decades later, is taking on the assignment. He's giving himself to write the English Summa, the English masterwork, uh, beginning with the English language, which I'll get to in a minute. And in the contract of these pilgrims who come together, it is determined that 30 pilgrims, there are 30, uh, will go to Canterbury, tell two tales out, do the right things, worshiping uh, at the shrine of St. Thomas of Becket, two tales back, and thinking of our mathematics, how many do you, tales do you have? 120. 120. Well, he never gets anywhere close to 120. He has about 22 tales. Um, some scholars take it very seriously. You know, this was the grand plan. I think it's a little sort of uh, snide joke at the expense of these hundred boys over there who have to have that, that excellence. But he had a much more organic idea where you don't have all the parts fitting together and the fragments are jostling with each other. Chaucer's adding stuff all the time. As a matter of fact, he adds a new pilgrim uh, along the way. Now, one of the things that Chaucer did of the many things that are absolutely original is that he told a whole gathering of tales. That's not absolutely original. But he assigns those tales each to an individual narrator. The story is Chaucer, or the Eye, or the Pilgrim, goes to this um, inn outside of the city of uh, London, across the Thames in Southwark, called the Tabard Inn, and he meets up with 29 other pilgrims. They all gather there together in order to travel from London 
uh, to Canterbury. And pilgrimaging was an extraordinarily powerful and popular uh, form of worship and holiday uh, strikes out uh, in Chaucer's time. But one of the things you need to worry about is safety. So not on, typically, they're going to gather together. They're going to travel together, um, all, all 30 of them. Chaucer somehow miraculously, he must have had an iPhone and a, and a tape recorder, <laughs> one night gets to know all 29 of them. And then in his general prologue, and we're going to bear down on one of those portraits, provides a uh, extraordinary portrait of each one of these uh, variegated pilgrims. Each one of these portraits is a tour de force. It's a kind of uh, poem of extraordinary subtlety, subtlety and accomplishment. And each one of the tales is to a degree, and maybe to a high degree, complementary to and expressive of, and maybe unknowingly critical of, self-critical of, the teller himself. So Chaucer does something that I think you're not going to find in any other example of Western literature and probably world, world literature, where you have the narrator and the tale in a kind of dialogic uh, dance, uh, one speaking to the other and the other speaking uh, to, the, to the first. The other of our, our uh, remarkable thing about Chaucer's arrangement for these works of literature I've mentioned is that he decided to put them on the road. So it's sort of hard to imagine how people walking and on horseback are going to be telling stories to each other, but that's one of the poetic fictions. But they're on the road, and they're, on, you know, they're in this pilgrimage, and they're going to Canterbury. And so the metaphors of the pilgrimage, the metaphors of going to um, Canterbury Cathedral, the metaphors of going to uh, a shrine of, 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 a, of an English a saint are not simply metaphors. They're sort of what you would call in medieval hermeneutics um, anagogical, that there's a spiritual dimension uh, to all of this. So although they're going to go off and have a good time, and although the, the, the real, are they right-wingers or left-wingers in Chaucer's time, would like to have seen pilgrimages abolished because all sorts of hanky-panky uh, went on uh, pilgrimages. <laughs> Um, it is, in essence, a metaphor for life or an analog to life from our world to, uh, uh, to, uh, to salvation. Um, okay, I'm way off my uh, Let's see what my notes tell me I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, okay. Um, so Chaucer decided, and he did have an option not to do this, to write in his native language. His contemporary, John Gower, wrote in three languages, Latin and French, Anglo-French uh, and English. Dante uh, made a quite astonishing choice not to write in Latin, but to write in Italian. Chaucer just decided to write in English. And remember, England is a tiny little backwater place out there in the middle of the North Sea. You know, It's not much of anything. But, and it's, it's, you know, who on the continent is reading anything in English? <laughs> uh, but Chaucer knew that um, his language had a, had a great deal of potential, uh, linguistically, poetically, and in terms of verse forms. So from the beginning, he writes in English more than in, uh, in any other language. English had a tradition of poetry for centuries before Chaucer. Uh, Talked to one of you out here, and you uh, alluded to um, Old English. But actually, um, Old English and Middle English are two different phenomena. Old English is the language of Beowulf. Anybody remember Beowulf? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All the same painful things. memories. Yeah. <laughs> it shouldn't be painful, but you know. Um, and Old English, oh, the poetry of Old English is, is the best poetry of the 8th, 9th, and 10th century to ever have survived. Uh, but it's a quite a different language, totally a Germanic language, uh, and it was pretty much scotched uh, with uh, in 1066 and all that. But just to give you a sense, because we're going to do some Middle English in a minute, what Old English sounds like. This is the first poem in Old English, or Anglo-Saxon, uh, to have been recorded, to have survived. It's about the 8th century, all right? New Shulen Cherian, Heaven read its word, May it tot his machta and his moge thank. Werk, Wulderfader, Swage, Wunder, Yewas, Eche, Drichten, After, Theode, 
Firmen voll dan Freya al nicht die. Any, but I mean any any sort of you know just first immediate Rorschach uh, responses feelings about Scandinavian, Scandinavian German absolutely consonants. English is a German language and consonants and a lot of consonants right a lot of fricatives right yeah okay uh, and I don't know if you can you say anything see anything about the the, the rhythm I didn't accentuate it too much very strong rhythms it's sort of like chopping wood chunk chunk. Pause, as yours called. Chunk, chunk. So, okay. And this poetry was, yeah, good. And, uh, yes, yes, good here. Mary, is it? Your name is? Mary. Yes, yeah, I remember. Mary, yes. Mary has remember, still remembers those opening lines of uh, General Prologue. Uh, an alliterative poetry, not a rhyme poetry. A stress poetry, and in fact, a chanted or cantillated poetry. Uh, it's a bit like um, hip hop now, right? Uh -huh. You have a kind of drone in the background like that. You know, it was a harp, and you and, and you have a cadence. I think it was cantillated or just sort of like liturgical chant and things like that. So it was a uh, a formal kind of poetry with all sorts of special um, uh, tropes that are available to people who are masters of this poetry, and everybody in the audience would understand those tropes, and you would understand that the poet is troping on those tropes. So only people who were really, really accomplished uh, made poetry, but a lot of people made poetry for their entertainment, you know, day in and day out. That's old English, but that went its own way after. Uh, I, uh, it didn't do anything to me. Am I, this, am I still? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, and then, with the invasion of the Normans and so on, the, uh, the language bounced around a bit. And, but by Chaucer's time, uh, French had been, integrated, uh, had been integrated in all sorts of ways. And the English language, which we now call Middle English, uh, was very pronounced and in dominance, uh, even in law, and then in poetry. So let's take a look at the general prologue, which all of you, some of you, remember and see what it sounds like. So, you're looking at <clears throat> the general prologue, see where we are, translation on the left and original, uh, translation on the right, original on the left. And I'll read some, and you just tune in. And then we'll come back and we'll read some. And then maybe Mary will read just all alone. <laughs> all <right. laughs> OK. And in terms of comprehension, I think you're going to comprehend almost all of it just by reading it and hearing it. But you can just skip over to the, you know, to the translation on the right, or just stay there if you wish. And we're also going to talk about how do you feel about this as poetry when we get to that. We're just linguistically working out right now. <clears throat> Honder apru with his shore is sota, the drachst of March hath pierced to the rota, and bothered every vine and switch liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the floor. When they fear us ache with his sweet of breath, in spirit hath in every holt and hech the tender croppets, and the younger sonna hath in the ram his halva coursey runner, and smaller fool is mocking melodia. That sleep in all the nicht with open ear, so prick at them not sure in hear courages. Fun long and folk to go on pilgrimages, and parments for to sake and stranger stranders, to fairer hallways, cooth and sundry wanders, and specially from every sheer resender of Engelon to Canterbury they wonder, the holy, blissful martyr for to sake, that him hath holpen on that they were sake. Beautiful, huh? Beautiful. Uh, any responses? Any? Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, and it, well, okay, first of all, it doesn't sound so Germanic, does it? Does it? No. Okay. And in fact, in terms of rhythm, any, remember way back then, prosody, the rhythm, the scansion is now iambic pentameter. Yeah? As you'll find in Shakespeare and Milton and all the way up to Wallace Stevens, all right? Iambic pentameter. And who brought iambic pentameter into the English language in poetry? Chaucer, okay. Other impressions, feelings, associations? It rhymes. 
alliterative. Yes, it rhymes. It's no longer you know, an alliterative, although he will do a little alliteration, but he's not too keen on alliteration because that has associations with the old way of doing things. Other impressions, thoughts, ah, questions for a moment, yeah. I think with spring coming that she was uh, more silent or something that maybe if it was October or November with winter coming, there would be a stronger feeling in what the person was saying. Well, we're in the middle of winter, so uh, we'll take our own vote there. Chaucer wrote one mock uh, dream vision, and he sets it on December 10th. And that's a, kind, that's a kind of joke, because you don't want to set your poetry on December 10th. All good poetry starts in May, starts with spring, starts with life, starts with love, starts with sex, starts with, yeah, a lot of sex in there. Okay, so it's... Um, it, this is this is a this is this opening is really I, I think of the Beatles line in you know the, the, the song to the sun and it's really a heliotropic opening yeah. which celebrates all the urgency and uh, vitality and thankfulness for having got through the winter. Mock and melodia. Yeah. And also they wouldn't have gone obviously on a pilgrimage until the weather got. That's right. I mean That's even right. in England. Yeah. Right. Oh no. The winter is pretty brutal. I mean, you couldn't even make it on, you know, the, on, so on the roads, on the roads very easily. I mean, they finally roll. the muck, we know, you know, yeah, mud, yeah, mud season. Mud season all right, year it's fine. Yeah, right. Days, yeah. Other impressions? Question here. Yeah. Did Latin have any influence on the language here? Everybody hear the question? No. Uh, <laughs> well, it, we, we do have uh, people with microphones when we get to the Q&A. question was, did Latin have any, flu any influence on this? Okay. <clears throat> First of all, England, English does not come from Latin. English is a Germanic language, and if you look at the Indo-European tree, you see that there are all, all of these branches and twigs, which include all of the Germanic languages, you know, you know, from Old Norse to Swedish to on and on and on. And then there's a Flemish, there's English, etc. Then you have the Romance languages, and the Romance languages are Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, Romanian, etc. What are they? They're modern Latin. They're modern Latin. Uh, so that's where Latin goes. Now, the kind of Latin that does influence English is, for the most part, a scholarly Latin, or a school Latin, or a liturgical Latin. And it does come into the language in a very major way. But what, oftentimes what we feel is, is Latinate about a word is that it's actually a French word. But the French goes back to Latin. But you know, excellent, excellent question. And you know, anybody who is a good reader, uh, auditor, let's say, of poetry and, and sensitive to language would feel all those nuances between something that leans in the, in the direction of a Latin um, sound, okay, or a Romance sound, French sound, or a Germanic sound, an Anglo Saxon sound. Yeah? Uh, the, the version we have that's in Middle English here in front of us, um, how cleaned up is this? I mean, both in the sense of standardizing with spellings and things like, what other letters, or were, were the letters have been different than the yes. Latin alphabet or were used to? Were yeah. were okay, yeah. right. Did everybody hear the question? What about the, uh, this is the orthography, the, 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 the orthography, what letters are there here and have they been cleaned up? Um, first of all, there are in well, Old English and in Middle English, a few graphic signs which are no longer in uh, modern English. One of them is the sign that represents the TH sound, voice to run voice TH. And this is the blackboard up here. It goes up like this, goes down like this, and then it swirls around like that. It sort of looks like a sexy P, okay? All right? Well, that represented in Old English, and it does in Old Norse as well, the TH sound, okay? And everybody knew that because that's all there was. But when the fonts come in to um, the printing presses in England in the 1480s, the French fonts or the Flemish fonts didn't have anything like a thorn. Okay? So what did they use? They used the Y, which was available in the, I know this is getting rather in the weeds here, but you know, <laughs> they used the Y and then they put a little virgule above it. Okay? So when you see a sign today, uh, Ye old English coffee shoppy? <laughs> Nobody ever said that. I mean, they didn't have coffee either, but ye, that way, no. It is a misreading of 
the, yeah. because you know, in a generation or two, they lost it. So that's one example. I don't know, but also about spelling. What about the spelling? You spell the way you hear it. The rules for spelling, and you know, you want to kill the grammarians who brought it in in the 17th century. That's why we have, okay. K-N-I-G-H-T. How is that pronounced in uh, Middle English? Yeah, Knicht. Just the way it's spelled. But now, you know, we have all those silent. And so we have to have Sesame Street uh, help us out. Okay. So all the spelling here is absolutely spot on. You would nevertheless have um, scribes who would be, come from different parts of the country, or you have spelling uh, habits that would be in one scriptorium or another scriptorium. Is that? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, um, Hi, Mary. Could you say something about pronunciation and mm -hmm. something called the great vowel shift? Oh, gosh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the great. Well, great vowel shift. Don't get, don't get the wrong ideas about the great vowel shift. Uh, <laughs> we used to have a dirty joke about it in graduate school. <laughs> something. We call it the Great Vowel Movement. <laughs> well, we're, we're Chaucerians. Sorry, sorry. That's not part of Chaucer I get all excited about. But between 1400 and 1600, this is going to be very quick, um, something happened to the English language that very rarely happened to other European languages. It went through a whole vowel shift. And every one of the vowels, the strong vowels, there are five of them, changed valence from this sound to that sound, to this sound to that sound. If I were to get, uh, uh, okay, let's see, the everyday guide to weena, okay, the everyday guide to wine, weena, wine, weena, wine, all right, wine, the I, that's actually a diphthong, weena is the long E uh, sound of Old French, Old English, and so on. So every one of those vowels shifted. And uh, somebody compared it to the Rockettes. One lifts a leg, another has to lift a leg, has to lift, or else they're just going to get all scrambled, or everything's going to be, um, uh, every, everything's going to be a pun with everything else. So you had this amazing shift in all of the vowels from about 1400 to 1600, and that's one of the things that students have to uh, internalize and go backwards through in order to get back to pronouncing uh, Middle English. I was just thinking of yeah. Shakespeare yes. does that. He, he rhymes with the post-shift sounds. Like he'll say, blow, blow, thou winter wind. Yeah. Thou art not so unkind. Yeah. Or is it keen? No, no. Uh, well, Shakespeare's sort of a little halfway between where, where yes, you are. Yes. If you heard Shakespeare doing, has anybody seen a Shakespeare play in the, you know, the original 16th century dialect? It's quite strange, and you feel like it's a kind of bad Cockney accent. You know, it's not the, you know, it's not the high elevated Rada accent uh, uh, whatsoever. So uh, I won't do a good job at this, but that time of year thou mayest in me behold, that time of year thou mayest be me in May behold. Yeah. I, I, I gotta get back to work here in a minute, eh? okay? Yes. <laughs> All right, so um, <laughs> We're going to do a little bit more. Oh, yes, we want to do, we want to all do our, our general prologue. Uh, now that we've forgotten it, let's get back to it. So you're ready to do it, and we'll do it. I'll do a line, and then you do a line, okay? This is supposed to be fun, all right? Juan that our pro with the shore of Sota. Juan that our pro with the shore of Sota. Same line. Same line. Let's do it again. And I want it more full throated, okay? Juan de la Pro with a shorter sota. The drought of March hath pierced to the rota. On bothered every vein and switch liqueur. Okay, now you all are going to do the next four lines and then we'll get on to something else. Keep on going. Juan, Zephyrus. Oh, no, of which okay, of which? Next line. Next. One more. 
Okay. That's, I know you want to go on. <laughs> okay. And I heard some modern French, you know, it's not tendre yet. It's not tendre. Not tendre yet, because middle French was tendre. Okay. Tendre. So it's tendre. Yeah, it's yeah. more tendre. fun following your pronunciation. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, if we have some... We probably all learned in school different, you know, but we're taking you as the... Yeah, the one who knows. well, it's a little bit, <laughs> in my profession, it's a little bit disappointing to see how poorly pronounced Chaucer's Middle English is by some very eminent um, Chaucerians, okay. but don't get me started. <laughs> okay, now, what about the Canterbury Tales themselves? They are very, very generically. They're not all fabliaux, dirty stories. They're not, by any means, all comic. The Knight's Tale is a very long, epic romance coming from a, ma a major work uh, by Boccaccio. The host, Harry Bailey, who's the guy who's the innkeeper who sort of takes over, you know, those kinds that just take over, um, <clears throat> decides that the next uh, tale teller is going to be the monk. But then the miller, uh, who is a stout carl for the notice, a big guy like this, and who's dead drunk, comes in like this and says, I've got a tale to tell that'll answer, that'll requite uh, and let the knight know what, uh, what his tale is really worth. And they just can't shut him up. So he comes in uh, and tells a fablio. Fablio, is that a term? Fablio is a... Burlesque? Huh? Is it a burlesque sort of? Um, it, it could have burlesque elements, right. It's, um, it, it's usually a short tale. It, there's usually a triangle, a sexy wench, her dumb husband, <laughs> and her lover, more often than not, a monk. <laughs> you know? And some of them are, I won't tell you how raunchy they are, <laughs> but not all of them. But Chaucer wrote uh, the, uh, the Miller's Tale, and it is, uh, it has its very raunchy moments. Do you, anybody remember? Yeah. Oh, wait, wait a minute. We have somebody here who, who was involved in a performance. Do you want to go, Do you want to go there? No. Okay. No. <laughs> all right. Um, Those were your burlesque days, right? Yeah. And this tale, it's about the as funny a story as you ever find in the English language. And it's extremely elaborate. But they're also, also I mean, I guess I won't tell you the story. But oh, all, oh, 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 a little bit? Okay. Well, there are three, actually four uh, characters. There's Allison, who is a very hot to trot hottie, okay? Uh, there is her <laughs> husband, who's about a thousand years older than her. <laughs> and it's very possessive. There are actually two would-be lovers. They're both students, clerks, and so on. One of them really knows what he's doing, and the other one is rather sort of light-footed and fancy dandy and sort of plays a flute and thinks he's a courtly lover and things like that. And to cut right to the chase, so what happens? Um, one of the lovers uh, agrees with her. I mean, the courtship lasts for about three seconds uh, <clears throat> to, you know, to to hook up, as my <laughs> students say, uh, as soon as the husband's out of town. But the other lover has come over to serenade them, the way you're supposed to do in courtly love. So he's down there under the shot window, and uh, his, uh, his com competition is up there in bed. Um, so what happens is that they know who this guy is, and to, uh, to play a joke on him, these two lovers, one of them sticks her arse out the window and says, come kiss me, all right? Okay, <laughs> and he says, he, he's taken aback, and he says, what's this? I didn't think a woman had a beard. <laughs> Sorry, you asked. <laughs> well, Chaucer does that all the time, he does this with this tale. He says, now those of you who don't want to go there, <laughs> turn the page, you know? There are other tales coming that are really moral, uplifting, you know, <laughs> Jesus would approve and things like that. <laughs> um, the Absalom, the, the, this, uh, 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 this would-be courtly lover who has been um, 
undone by this misdirected kiss, as the uh, <laughs> scholars call it, goes off and gets this very hot coulter, this hot uh, piece of metal, and comes back and is going to get his just rewards, all right? So he, he knocks on, on, the, on, the, on the door again, on the window again, and this time the lover, uh, the male lover, uh, says, it's my turn. So he sticks his arse out the window and phew, very, very hot colder meets, uh, uh, meets with his arse. And then there's, a, oh, there's, a, there's, a, there's another plot that's happening on the side that I may mention. That old geezer, the husband, has been told that the world is coming to an end uh, and that it's going to be uh, the flood, uh, not Noah's flood, but another Noah's flood, and they're going to tie themselves in these uh, tubs up in the, in, in the rafters. And when he hears... The, lo the lover with the hot toot scream, ah, water, water. <laughs> the husband cuts the rope because, you know, the idea is that they're going to go down and get in the water and get in, in, in the flood and float away. Okay. Can I stop there? Yes. Yeah, get a little bit. Okay. So I'm talking about generic variety. There are saints' lives, wonderful saints' lives. Uh, there are Marian miracles, Mar you know, the virgin... Uh, Virgin Mary um, miracles. Uh, there's uh, the patient Griselda story, one of the most famous stories uh, in in all of uh, in all of Europe. Finally, in the middle of all of this, Harry Bailey, who's the um, uh, who's the host, turns to this little guy Chaucer, you know, and nobody, you know, he's just sort of mousing around, looking looking in the bushes, very shy and so on. Harry pulls him forward and he says. Come on, come on, come on, it's time for you to tell a story. Chaucer, I don't know, no, no, tell a story. So Chaucer uh, starts telling a story. And um, it's called the Tale of Sir Topaz. And it is an alliterative rhyme. And uh, it's in the old fashioned form uh, of uh, romance adventures, you know, Robin Hood stuff and things like that. And it is, frankly, brilliantly bad poetry. It couldn't have been more bad. So bad, so bad, it is so good. Got that? It is a parody par excellence. But Harry Bailey doesn't quite get that, and he says, shut up to Chaucer, all right? Uh, he says, your drasty reaming, your drasty rhyme is not worth a turd. In Middle English, of course. And, uh, and, and finally Chaucer said, why, why do you cut me off? You don't cut anybody else off. And, he finally, and Chaucer said, well, I have one more tale. And it's in prose, and I'll tell that, and Harry says, go with that. And so Chaucer tells this tale, Melody in prose, and it goes on for about five hours, all right? <laughs> and then it finally comes to, to an end, and Harry actually likes it. I'm still talking about other kinds of uh, tales. There are tales about marriage. Uh, there are tale, a lot of them about marriage. The Wife of Bath, finally get to the Wife of Bath. Oh, yeah. How many of you at least go ding, ding, ding in your memories with the Wife of Bath? Oh, yeah. No. She is probably the most celebrated woman in English literature. Oh, she is fantastic. When Chaucer, I mean, there are only, well, three women in the general prologue. And why are there only three when there are three people? Uh, it's not because Chaucer is absolutely misogynistic, but there isn't a tradition, a satiric tradition. You just have the religious woman and then you have the secular woman. So when Chaucer turns to his secular woman, the wife of Bath, his imagination just takes off, and he's able to find a voice, and find his own voice, but to find a voice for women speaking back to power after these centuries, centuries of male, celibate, misogynistic theologians condemning nature, women, sex, erotic desire, on and on and on, with extraordinary prurient vehemence. And the wife of Bath gets in there with all of the other, with all of the big guys, all of the theologians, and starts duking it out with them. St. Paul, Augustine, on and on and on and on. A long, <laughs> long, long, brilliant um, uh, debate in the medieval fashion, pro et contra debate. Years ago, my senior medievalist and I would put on, uh, talk about burlesque, a burlesque skit. <clears throat> um, which went on for two and a half hours, and we said it in pig Latin and something else English. But, I, but he was the liberal, uh, a lot of scholarly artists, and I was the uptight 
uh, conservative. But it was, it, was a, it was a real, I mean, we quoted a lot of uh, major words, and it really demonstrated some of the debates, very live debates, that are still going on today, by the way, uh, in some ways. Okay, the wife of Bath, and she sets off a series of uh, tales uh, that have, have to do with marriage and with many another thing. Um, I won't mention all of them. This one I've got to sort of advertise, the one that I spent about a third of my life uh, working on, the nun's priest tale, which is a beast fable, Aesopian beast fable. <clears throat> and my contention in a book that's 450-something uh, pages long is that it is Chaucer's uh, Ars Poetica. It is a poem which brings together all of the uh, issues that uh, he had been concerned with as a poet uh, all his life. It is about as funny as you can, uh, you can get, but there's a kind of comic uh, wisdom to it. And it is a celebration of poetry for poetry's sake. Now, I'm getting close to the end of my run through, scamper through uh, the, um, uh, <coughs> the Canary Tales. There's a tale about alchemy. Alchemy. Chaucer seems to know everything about everything, but he knows an extraordinary amount about alchemy, and somebody who had worked for an alchemist comes in and joins them. So a tale about alchemy. And uh, at the very end, uh, there's a tale, an Ovidian tale, which is about the most ugly tale you ever find that seems to be defecating on poetry itself. And right before, right before you get to the very end, uh, there is a sermon. The parson uh, is called upon as they begin to approach, approach Canterbury, and everybody feels it's time to finally hear from the parson. He says, you're not going to get any poetry from me. No rim, rim, rah, no rhyme. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the seven deadly sins, and I'm going to tell you how you can work your way towards salvation by the grace of God. A long treatise. Chaucer is clearly very, very serious about this. Took a lot of time writing it out, not absolutely originally. But that's the last tale in the Canterbury Tales. And before he, okay, and, and it seems to be a kind of rejection of everything that went before it. We don't want poetry. Think about this. Do, why are you here? Do you really think poetry is going to save you? Is poetry really going to make you a better person? The parson says no. The last word of Chaucer is his retraction. Very short, after the parson's tale, and it's a kind of prayer. And in it, he beseeches God to forgive him for his sins. And then he says, forgive me for, and he goes through almost all the tales that he wrote except those that were moralities or saints' lives. And he ends with a prayer for his own soul. That's quite an extraordinary conclusio. To use it. How can you get through all of these other tales and then end up with something that seems to be an absolute pulling of the rug from under the whole poetic enterprise? I know I think things can be said about it. I've, I've written about it and so on. But it is, as my students would say, a bummer. <laughs> after, after, okay. So I said we're going to go until yeah, maybe about 10, uh, 10 more minutes. Now we have another assignment, and that is, that is, that is, uh, the portrait of the monk. We're going to do some close reading. You cannot really appreciate Chaucer all that well unless you read him extremely closely. So everybody found the portrait of the monk? It, all we have is the original in Middle English. You see it? Yes. So I'm going to read a little bit, uh, and I can help you out if you uh, want. But we're just going to see what kinds of responses we might have, asking ourselves, what is Chaucer up to? Asking ourselves, what kind of person is this monk? Asking ourselves, what kind of value judgments might we make, might Chaucer want us to make? What does the monk think of uh, himself? What are their standards of our uh, evaluation of him? And where are there some points where well, there's a nice little nuanced or ambivalent or ironic uh, turn in the logic of the connection of all of these disparate parts? Okay? So think about a monk, first of all. All right? You got your monk thought on? Okay. What is a monk? 
Why is a monk a monk? And so on. As well, a matter of fact, what are the monk's vows are? What are the religious vows? Of Chastity. Any? Yes. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah. Poverty. Poverty and obedience. obedience. The three. Okay? All right. A monk there was, a fair for the maestria, an utridere, that loved veneria, a manly man, to bane and abed abel. Full many a dainty horse had he in stable, <laughs> and when he rode, men meeched his bridle hair, jingling in a whistling wind out's clair, and ache as lewd as doth the chapel bella, there as his lord was caper of the cella. Okay, we'll stop there for a minute. Do you want some glossing, some assistance, uh, meanings of things here, or would you like to just take a... We got most of it. Okay, yeah, but take it or not. Now we're, now we're getting into literary commentary, or literary criticism, or what do we make of this, or what is Chaucer asking us to make of this? He's not your typical monk. How so? Uh, well, he's, he's loved venery. Oh, and what does venery mean? Uh, hunting. <laughs> hunting? Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, did you hear that? <laughs> Uh, we've heard venery hunting, sex, any more? Hunting, sex, what does venery mean? Think of venereal disease. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Uh, you know, well, I mean, what is it? Yeah, Ben Franklin says, eschew venery. Oh, ben, Franklin. Oh, ben Franklin. But, but, but true, even back in Middle English, it has that venerian uh, nuance to it. But Charles doesn't say that, but you know, there's a whole tradition about, you know, I told you about Fabio, okay? Yeah. So there's a word that has ambivalences oh. surrounding. Other thoughts? Uh, What's an outrider, by the way? Do we have a note here? Yes, we do have a note. Um, monk with business outside the monastery. What's at issue there? What's at issue? Well, he's not monkish. What? He's not monkish. According to whose idea of... Uh, Monkliness. Why is he not monkish? Um, he's out in the world. He's riding a horse. He's got possessions. Yes, and yes, and yes. Fancy horse. And fancy horse. But, you know, when the monastery started, there it was claustration, cloisteredness. The whole idea of a monastery is that you separate yourself from the world and you live in a kind of simulacrum of paradise. But what happens, those of you who have been to Europe, what happens to the monasteries in time? They beget to be enormously big, enormously powerful. People keep giving them money. They're businesses. And you have to have, yes. Well, no, I'm, here, here my, I'm going back and forth. But you have to have entrepreneurs. You have to have people who market. You have to have people who work you know, with the world outside. Sales yeah, sales department, that's right. And let's respect that, you know? I remember a couple of articles written by monks saying, you know, uh, uh, precisely on this. This is what we have to have, you know, in this world. Okay. So that's what an outrider is. Any other comments? You want to keep? Attractive, did I hear? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> How so? Well, he describes him as being extremely fine or handsome. Um, and manly. Manly. And manly. And man, he's a manly man. <laughs> you no, know, I told you I do uh, men, men's studies. I mean, now, first of all, you say, wait a minute. If you have a monk... <laughs> And he's being, and in the third line, you find out he's a manly man. <laughs> and he whistles. Something wrong there. Well, you know, uh, I, mean, to, I mean, but Chaucer's sort of responding, in some ways, I suspect, his own sense of himself. This guy is cojones, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so if you want, and we can follow the sort of the manliness or the sexual part or the physical part as we go along. Any other, one other comment that we'll keep on going? Okay, where did we stop? Oh, keeper of the cell. Okay, keeper of the cell. Da, 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 da. Okay, oh yeah. So, the rule of St. Mar and of St. Benet, because that he, it was old and some days straight, this Ilka monk lay old a thing as Spasa, and hailed after the newer world of Spasa. <laughs> hey, ye have not of that text to pull at hand, that saith that hunters be not holy men, nay, that a monk, when he is retulace, is lignit to a fish that is waterlace, this is to say a monk out of his cloister. But Filka text, Hailed hay not worth an oyster. <laughs> and I'm going to focus, have you focus on the next few lines here. And he said his opinion was gold. What showed he studia and mock himself in woad upon a boat and cloister all way to poor or swinken with his hand as labour as austin bit? Who shall the world be servant? 
let Austin have his swing to him reserve it. Somebody want to put that argument that you know the Chaucer, the narrator, the I is is uh, speaking out on behalf of the monk four. Somebody want to put that, those into words? What does he say? Right. What good is it to study in the cloister? Or and. Uh, Augustine. <gasps> oh. Yeah, that's where our uh, Austin comes As from, right? How does that relate to the post author of a monastic rule? Right, right, right. But okay, I want to hear a little bit more. Ch this is ch I mean, this is probably one of the most delicious. <laughs> one, I, and you know, and he said his opinion was gold. Any comments on this? That's Chaucer is E. Chaucer I is I. Well. But the, the, the monk doesn't want to have anything to do with old friends. That's right. Mm -hmm. And how about Chaucer? No, Chaucer agrees with him. And Chaucer him. agrees with him. Yeah. Yeah. And? Uh, I love the line of he didn't, he didn't care for the text of a pulled hand. Right, that's right. Not what it sounds like, like. Like a rat's ass or something like yeah, that. Yeah, right. right? Yeah, but wait a minute. I mean, we, the, the most powerful word in our language and the most labile word in our language is I. All right? Yeah. Uh, we're all spin doctors when it comes to I. Mm -hmm. Does, do we trust Chaucer? Do we believe Chaucer? Do we agree with Chaucer? Does Chaucer want us to agree with him here? No, I don't no. think so. Uh -huh. I think he's being, um, uh, what's the word? He's revealing the church. OK. You might be saying, go ahead. You, you might be saying he's, well, but he's, he's agreeing with. Yes. Yes. So that is irony. Right? Irony, okay, okay, there's a word. Iron. Chaucer's iron, I mean, Chaucer's the ironist of the first order. You'll never find a better ironist in the English language, in, in literature, by the way. But what, where you're going, just tell me your name again. I'm Laura. Laura, that is, you're saying, and Chaucer, like a chameleon, and I would say he tends to do this a lot, is taking on, internalizing some of the thoughts, some of the sentiments, uh, some of the proclivities, some of the this, this, and that, and that, of the subject of uh, of the person he's talking about. Mm -hmm. So I said his opinion, I say this and I say that. Now it doesn't mean that you just with irony turn it upside down. He's not saying that. But he's, 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 he's moving things into a place of sort of plastic play. You know, where it goes back and forth and back and forth. But you have with Chaucer always the issue of how far am I gonna go with him? Because he's always not only testing you, but he's testing your own belief system. You see that? Yes. You see that? Yeah. I mean, a satirist would be much more crude, all right? He just would have come in like that. Chaucer says, I agree. I mean, after all, and it's not like it's entirely a wrong idea. I mean, times change. Fashions changes. You know, you can't live by the old order and so on. Okay. Let us move a little bit further. He even seems to say it would be a waste if this individual's God. That's gift. right. Yeah. That's right. It's right. God-given God power. Yeah. Absolutely. Isn't yes. that great? Right. Thank God that he has all of these things going for him. Okay. Okay, now let's do the rest. Therefore, watch out for Chaucer's therefores. Yeah. Therefore, he was a precursor or a Precursor meaning? What? You see where we are? Hunter. Hunter. Okay. Gray who does he had as swift as fool of fleet, of pricking and of hunting for the horror, was all his lust, for no cost will he spara. He say his flavors perfil it out the hand with grease, and that the finest of a lot. And for to fessa his hold under his chin, he had of gold he rocked a full curious pin, a luvacanot in the greater and there was. His head was ballad that shone as any glass, and ache as fast as he had been anoint. He was a lord full fat and in gold point. His e'en stape and rolling in his head, that stamen as a fornace of a laid, his boat a supla, his horse in great start, new certainly he was a fair prey lot. I'm leaving the last three lines for the end. Any, there's a lot of stuff here. Oh, yeah. But what, he, what captures your fancy? Quite thinks well of himself. Oh, does he ever think well of himself? He's supposed to be Talk celibate. about living now in the age of narcissism, yeah. Okay. And he's supposed to be celibate, but he's wearing a pin with a big love knot. Yeah, well, there are all these suggestions. I mean, yes. we can't nail it down. But there, this this sort of like common made up here, you know. There's there's all of this sort of um, amorous dallying with language and with possible symbolism and things like that. He dressed and acted like a dandy. You know. 
like there were dandies in those days. Well, but boy, is he a heavy duty dandy? I mean, he, he's he's a linebacker. I mean, yeah, he is he is he. Uh, yeah, well, he loves his clothes, right? And clothes say an awful lot in Chaucer's time and our time. And you know, he got all the leather, all of the shininess, uh, all the suppleness, uh, it, all this expense. You know, you're not supposed to be worried about your clothing. In it. One or two other comments here. I would just say, I mean, we are what we eat. I mean, all of the stuff about food, it's almost like he is being served, you know, with a, an apple in his mouth. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, he is so physical. He's all body, right? He's all body. He even used the word Car lust. lust. Yeah, well, he lust, 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 you know, it's not as lusty that lust. And lust means desire, but it goes in the direction of lust, all right? Now, I'm going to ask you to just uh, bear down on the last three lines, and then I'm going to come to a conclusion. He was not Paul as a forpinet ghost, a fat swan loved he best of any roast, his palfrey was as broom as is a barrier. My question is, he was not Paul as a forpinet ghost. What does that mean and what goes on in your head? How how do you mean that? Okay, he was brown as a berry. Oh, oh no, right. So he wasn't pale. That's right. He was a healthy, very fit, sportsman, outdoor, active type. Right. Keep on going. When, when you think, let me ask you, a four-peated ghost. Four-peated means sort of pining away or pined away. Ghost means spirit. A ghost means soul, like the Holy Ghost. What might you think about as an example of four-peated ghosts in Christian tradition? Monks. Jesus. Boy, who said that? Jesus. He said Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Yes? Who else? I said monks. Who? Monks. The cloistered monks. Well, if we were to, if you would have an ideal monk uh, who was very uh, uh, abstemious and just, uh, you know, self -denying. A, a, a self denying, right. Self mortifying. Yes. Yeah. But who you know, who are the champions or heroes or ideal figures of Christianity? They are thin, emaciated, uh, almost disembodied, tortured souls. Right? Think of Jesus. I guess. I'm going back to that. Think of Jesus. So Hmm? Or John the Baptist, right? Uh, saints. And saints. saints and, yes, saints. and flagellants. Yes. And martyrs, right? So what happens when we get to that line? So is your religion very, very important? Okay, Was, wasn't religion very, very important in Chaucer's time? Yes. But the, the, in the middle, in Chaucer's time, everything else was very important too. The uh, pleasures of the flesh were considered to be important, but Chaucer, no question, was a Christian writer. No question that he was a believer. No question that he ended his, uh, his Canberra Tales the way we know he, he ended. What happens? I'm back. I mean, for me, most interesting thing with Chaucer is what goes on. I think Chaucer that finds the most interesting thing is what goes on in our minds. What goes on in our minds? Well, yeah. I think we think of all those saints and, yeah. and the apostles and, and see that he's just the opposite. He's supposed to be a, a man of the, uh, you know, man of the church, mm -hmm. and he is nothing like what everybody mm -hmm. worships as the heroes, so to speak, of the Christian religion. Anybody else want to say? I mean, I, I think I would be a little bit more ambiguous in my feeling. I mean, you're politically correct, or, or religiously <laughs> correct, but when you say, Does he, do, you, "Do you want to be a four peanut ghost?" God, I don't yeah. want to be a four peanut ghost. <laughs> you want to live like that? No, this guy is just. Life incarnate, you know, he is just the happy man of physical sensation and outdoorsmanship and things like that. So my point being, and then I've got to get to my conclusions, I've got too far, is that Chaucer is moving us through a very complicated, nuanced, uh, labile uh, landscape, uh, poetry, poetry scape of various different values. And here just on, uh, emphasizing the play between the physical uh, and the spiritual, and he is not asking you to stand right here. Matter of fact, he's using himself 
as a device of moving you over there towards the monk. And if you want to move back away, you can do that. But he's not going to force you. Okay, I'm concluding the last five minutes. Um, and you could ask me any question, but okay. Why, uh, why do I love Chaucer? Is that okay? Why do I love Chaucer? Um, Because he's my man. I mean, he is. I mean, I've written about other things, and, but I, this is. Uh, I've never, 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 never lost my love for Chaucer. And every time I read him, I read him again and again and again. I feel he is more subtle, more humane, more refined, more generous. Uh, one of the things I love about Ch Chaucer is that he does not want to exclude anybody. Dante has a way of saying, "If you don't work at my level, so be it." But Chaucer wants you to enjoy his poetry here, 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 here. But he also puts so much of his poetry that the more pressure you put on the poetry, the more it opens up, the more forgiving it is, uh, the more in, uh, enriching it is. To go to the, the title of the talk, Chaucer is incredibly funny. He's incredibly comic. But he's also profoundly serious, uh, a major classicist very interested in religious stories and ultimately very much re uh, interested or committed to writing poetry that has hopefully some effect upon the improvement of your chances um, of salvation. Um, it is a little bit unnerving to me that Chaucer, unlike Shakespeare, has not been embraced by the popular media uh, of our time. And I'm now reading for reviewing a book on Chaucer in the movies. And a lot of the essays say, what? It's Chaucer in the movies. Whereas Shakespeare is always in the movies. And Shakespeare's always, and of course Shakespeare's a dramatist. But uh, even though people recognize Chaucer as um, a, a genius of the first order, certainly comparable to Shakespeare, certainly comparable to Milton, perhaps because it doesn't make a good movie, even though I heard about you know, a, a play being made out of the, out of the Canterbury Tales. Uh, Knight's Tale, if you ever saw that, has Chaucer in it, uh, but uh, he's sort of a kind of uh, comic figure. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's seen naked more than anything else. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's a gambler. It doesn't just tra simply doesn't translate all that way into the, the, the new media. And I think that's a pity. I'm very happy to see everything done possible with uh, Shakespeare. I don't care how disrespectful it might be, it's doing another Shakespeare. I wish that something like that would happen more than not, uh, with, uh, than it, it does happen with Chaucer. Finally, I mean, what do I think you should do if you want to continue developing an interest in Chaucer? Uh, I did bring a re very recent <laughs> translation, which I'll hold up before you, and it just has the Middle English on one side and the translation on the other side. Now, the selected Canterbury Tales, Geoffrey Chaucer, a new verse translation by Sheila Fisher. Only, it's not all the tales, but most of them, only $15. And um, start your own book group. Start reading Chaucer, and if any of you have any, uh, have, have, have any uh, money in a film company, see, uh, see if you can get, I mean, we had, we had Shakespeare in love, right? Uh, should we have Chaucer in love? Somehow it just like. So thanks for this, uh, for being attentive to me, and let's get on to Q&A uh, for the time that we have. My question is about the, uh, perhaps another interpretation of the sermon at the end that you described. And I wonder if um, perhaps instead of uh, Chaucer's uh, own um, concern about his own salvation. He was worried uh, perhaps about censors or uh, a way to uh, back out of implications that might have um, gotten him in trouble with some authority. Well, that notion was floated um, early part of the 20th century. But you know, it just doesn't... Um, hang together because for the most part the church and the people of the church were unusually tolerant for profane mm -hmm. 
literature. Chaucer satirizes a lot of religious figures. No problem. Everybody was satirizing uh, literary uh, figures. There was a thesis that, you know, the, the, at, you know it's a, sort of a deathbed conversion, and then a sort of Pascalian wager, wager. Well, I'd better go for condemning uh, my works because it's better than not to condemn them. But there's no evidence, for instance, that he ever tried to bring them back in, like uh, Kafka did, and things like that. So I don't think it's out of the order. I mean, out of the out of, out of, out of the order of the possible. But um, the question is, what kind of gesture is it uh, if he writes that, uh, and then he writes his and then he writes his retraction? Uh, is it some scholars say, well, it's part of his poetry, and so it's only at the level of what poetry's true meaning is? But it just seems so deeply felt, you know, his retraction. I mean, I, I wrote a whole thing about the retraction. I don't want to get into that. I don't think it is a monologic statement. Simply, this is what I'm doing. But it's a kind of, uh, uh, it's a, a sort of a paradoxical sophism that he articulates. But that's, a, that's not a very good answer to your question, but it's a very real question. And, uh, okay, uh, somebody else? I, okay. I just wanted to make a comment uh, uh, pertinent to what you just said about Chaucer being more in movies and mm -hmm. modern modern things, I ran into a couple of teenagers who had just studied uh, the Canterbury Tales in high school, and they told me, I had just been in a, in, a, in a concert where we sang some mamas and papas songs, you may know this, but there is a song that they play mm -hmm. with the words, the opening prologue, to one of the mamas and papas songs, uh, either California Dreaming, mm -hmm. or I forget the, you know, and I can't remember whether it was in the Middle English or in real English, but it's got the pictures of the of the pilgrims mm. float. And if you if you Googled or you looked up Canterbury Tales, Mamas and Papas, let's okay. say, you'd find it. And they mm -hmm. sent it to me. And it's the way they teach. They knew all about it because they'd heard it. They were connecting it with the Mamas and That's Papas cool. song. And they knew it by heart, That's not fantastic. singing it. That's in the old English? In the middle English? I can't remember. Okay. I can't remember whether it was in the middle or in the modern English. been translated, but it was, you know, well, you know, I can't say it, but look it up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I will. Beautiful. Hi. Um, I had a question about how, in the Canterbury Tales, they're obviously sitting around sp speaking in verse. Um, but the, the couple of times in the Canterbury Tales where they changed to English, for instance, where Chaucer at the end of the um, Sir Topaz story and the Parsons. Um, Sermon. It's a big deal. It's like uh, Chaucer is sort of really apologetic about he's going to be doing this. And as you said, there's the whole point where the, the parson is like, well, we've got to get away from all this stuff. If you had a group of educated people at that time sitting around telling stories, is, do we have any indication that they would have really been trying to tell their tales in something like verse or at least something more elevated than just prose? I don't, I don't think so. Okay. You get the question, did they actually speak in verse or... Or verse, tell stories. Or tell stories in verse. I don't think so. Okay. It would be wonderful if they, <laughs> if they, they could have. Not, not easily done. I don't think so. Uh, in, in Old English, um, the, the famous story of Cadman is that he was an uh, illiterate uh, shepherd and he was sitting around the uh, dinner table and they would pass the uh, harp from person to person. And they, uh, the general lead tells the story, and each person would sing uh, their, you know, their poetry. And they would be composing, mm -hmm. in quote, double quotation marks, that poetry as they were singing it. But all the English, you can sort of make it up as you go along, because there's so many formulas that you could uh, play around with. But Middle English, I just don't think so. Like Homer. Well, Homer's all, yeah, is, is, is precisely, I mean, that, that's, that's, uh, that's you know, the Old English and the Homeric are both um, poetry that are composed on the spot. Wow. Yep, yep. So it was no longer like the top rap when it got to the English. So Hello. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Stairs. Okay. This is, the, the acoustics here are really disoriented. Uh, I wanted to ask you to say, something about um, the meaning or the role of Canterbury in this at that time, or what Canterbury symbolized 
for why did he choose Canterbury? Well, you know, today, you know, the the Archbishop of uh, the Anglican Church is Archbishop of Canterbury. It is the seat of, the center of, uh, the English um, religious order. And uh, in no small part because of Thomas of Becket's shrine there. So to go to Canterbury is to go from London, you know, the worldly city, if you will, the sinful city, to the city of God, uh, which would be Canterbury. So it would have extraordinary power, aura, uh, to it. Um, I, I sent the folks here, they wanted <laughs> the picture of me. I couldn't find a picture. I, found, I was there at Canterbury at the cathedral uh, last summer, and I had one picture of me at that cathedral. We Chaucerians pilgrimaged down to... Uh, uh, but the the shrine is not there anymore. Uh, Henry VIII took it away, uh, so it's not quite the you know the resonance center uh, of religious uh, uh, feeling as it was as it was in Chaucer's time. But it's also a national, you know, political. I and mean, if you were English, and you, I mean, why go all the way to Paris, or why go all the way to Santiago, or why to go all the way to Rome, or why to go all the way to Jerusalem? The White Path went all those places, by the way, when you could sort of take a shorter. Uh, pilgrimage. Was it was it the most popular place to go in, on pilgrimage? In England. In England. But he is buried there. Hmm? He is buried there, though. Thomas the Becket, I mean. Uh, you say the shrine was taken away. The shrine was taken over. Taken away. Yep. yep. If, if nobody's seen okay. the movie with Peter O'Toole and Richard Burton called Beckett, watch it. <laughs> it's really terrific. Oh, terrific. Right. <laughs> Tells the whole story. Hmm. Okay. Probably five more minutes for any other. And I like questions that are off the wall. Okay, here's an off the wall question. I'm thinking of the three thieves um, yeah. around the tree. Yeah. Um, but I'm not getting too far, remembering it. But um, I want. That's, that's the partner's tale. It's the partner's tale? Yeah. Right. And what's um, Chaucer? commenting on in that tale. Greed. That's right. I mean, the one of the ex most extraordinary human beings ever created by a English writer is the partner uh, who is evil incarnate. Oh. But, just, you just start with that. He knows he's evil incarnate. He celebrates the fact that he's evil incarnate. Everybody knows that they don't want having anything to do with them on the pilgrimage. But it's time for him, to, and they say, look, if you're going to have to do, okay, but tell a good story, a moral tale, and so on. And he tells a story that twists his audience in one direction after another direction after another direction after another direction, but they don't know where they are going. Uh, until finally, after confessing what a fraud he is, how all of his record, records are, are fake, how when he goes out to these country churches, he just scams everybody, and B is so good at it, and he's such an amazing, powerful uh, preacher and so on. He brags about the brilliance of his evil devices. And then what does he do? He says, by the way, there's one more thing I want to uh, uh, ask of you. These are the Canterbury Pilgrimage. I have these relics, <laughs> and I want you to come up and buy them, because who knows? You might fall off your horse and kill yourself uh, in the next couple of uh, minutes or anything like that. He has the audacity to turn things around and put that in their face. And Harry Bailey, whom I mentioned several times, goes ballistic. Matter of fact, he says, Harry, you are the most enveloped in sin. You are the most involved in sin. You come up to me first. Um, I think about the, the partner more than any other of the pilgrims, and I, I read Kierkegaard from the partner's point of view, or the partner of view, because here's somebody who has fallen out of the hands of grace of the living God, who has suffered so much for his own, he's, he's, got, he's got sexual identity issues and things like that, but he is a tortured soul. Talk about a four-peanut ghost. And he's pure evil, he's such pure evil that he goes beyond evil into some other realm of being, which... Wow. And in some ways, I think he's more self-knowing than any other person on the pilgrimage. So much for the, you know, that. So I don't dismiss the partner saying, oh, he's a bad guy, and leave it at that. 
Any other off the wall questions? Yeah. Is there any poet, contemporary poet, that has the qualities of Schwarzer? The two sounds of them. Yes. Your name is again, please. My name? Yeah. Gene. Gene. You ask great questions. Doesn't he ask great questions? Um, I was thinking about it as I was driving down. And I would say one of them is the Pearl Poet. We don't have a surname for him or name for him. Or the Garwain Poet, who was a contemporary of Chaucer's, lived up in the Northwest around uh, uh, Chester, wrote five poems. Uh, Garwain and the Green Knight, you may have heard. Yeah. right? And Pearl, you may have uh, heard of. Uh, Patience uh, is, uh, is another one. St. Erkenwald. Um, He's a total mystery. How somebody up there in the boondocks uh, could be so sophisticated. There's no court there or anything like that. Writing in a Northwestern dialect, which is very hard for us to, uh, to sort out, he can do things that Chaucer doesn't do. So that's the first person I would turn to. And then there, there'd be others who I wouldn't quite put on the, in the, same, uh, the same level. But, it, I mean, at a certain point, I don't want to play the games. You know, I use these superlatives. Oh, he is the best of this and the best of that. But people who are not the best are the best in many other ways. Uh, so the Pearl Poet. So, so I'm just wondering, you said that, you know, he, he wrote in English, and in some ways this was a, a surprising thing because all these other, you know, highbrow poetry was written in other languages. So, so to what extent were the, the Canterbury Tales kind of considered the, the domain of the elite, you know, the, that just the, the very upper crust would know about, but the commoners would have no knowledge of, or, or how, much, um, how much were they, they kind of widely known? And the other question is kind of related. Um, it seems like a lot of people hear about the Canterbury Tales and if they don't know anything about them, they're, they're kind of shocked that some of them could be so bawdy and risque. Um, to what degree, I'm wondering, was that shocking in his time? I mean, was there a lot of, you know, outrage? Mm -hmm. How was it received, really? Okay. Tell, tell us your name, please. Jeremy. Jeremy. Um, I hear three questions there. Uh -huh. One is um, the, first, the first question. Chaucer's poetry was for the elite. Chaucer's poetry was for the elite. Um, not only because only the elite are um, literate, okay, but it's being, uh, you know, as I, these manuscripts are being shared among a group of aficionados uh, who were clerks and intellectuals and poets and also um, uh, men of the cloth and also uh, some warrior types all around, the, all around London, all around uh, the royal court. But that was it. So a very small uh, uh, audience uh, of elites. So if you read Chaucer and you see you know, these peasants doing this and all of this uh, scatological stuff going off and say, oh, well, that's because this is uh, poetry for the peasantry or for the lower middle class, in fact, not true. The second question I heard was, uh, what about? Those, you know, what about, well, the, what about the risque, all the risque qualities? Well, we tend to think the further we go back in time, the more Victorian things get. <laughs> Not so. <laughs> the, these family o that I was telling you about, uh, that I said I swore I would not tell you some of the most outrageous uh, examples of them, they were in, uh, most of them in Anglo French, they were in uh, collections of uh, manuscripts, codices that were owned by very wealthy people, aristocrats. The aristocrats love this stuff. So yeah, they love this stuff. Now, of course, they would use lower class people to, uh, to be the ones who would behave, uh, to behave this crudely. But there is no Victorian sense that, oh, that is, um, that's, just been, uh, that's just beneath us. And the third question, I forgot what the third question was. Do you remember what the third question was? That was it. There was, there was like a there was a half question, but okay. Is that good? Do you want to follow up on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.